Good morning from AXA Coral Live. It's great to have you with us. We're broadcasting live from the Kalmabi Research Station here on the island of Curaçao in the Caribbean. Welcome one and all. It's our final day, so it's a little bit tinged with sadness. It's been wonderful having you with us. Uh, schools and countries we have with us this morning. We have uh, schools from Nigeria, Portugal, the UK, Romania, Switzerland, India, Thailand, Egypt, Greece, Sweden, Cyprus and Israel. Really big welcome to you all and there's some special shout outs um, here. We've got 5th Gymnasium of Glyfada. Uh, welcome, really great to have you with us. Uh, we have St Paul's Junior School in Shepton Mallet. Great that you can join us. Brilliant. Uh, we have class um, 9B at the Heritage Private School. Uh, and we have, amazingly, the whole of Key Stage 2 at Edith Morehouse School. Really big welcome to you guys. Uh, we have uh, Novo uh, Yegorivka School in the Ukraine. Brilliant that you're with us this morning. Um, and I've got a little sort of like dots coming in on the live feed that there may be more coming up. And I'll give you a shout out if that does happen. Oh, we have Kite Class at West Moncton Primary School. Um, fantastic. And I'm just going <laughs> to... There's this dots coming through on the live feed. There's a little bit of time to bring that all the way from your fantastic classroom to us here in the Caribbean on Axa Coral Live. Now, this morning is all about adaptation. And we're going to be looking at the shape of sharks. Streamlined sharks is our live investigation this morning. And this is our shark tank. Uh, hopefully, you will all have your shark tank um, in your classroom or you'll be doing this activity shortly afterwards. Now Coral Live is all about the amazing world of coral. It's all about science and STEM. And we're here really between two amazing things. Well, two amazing things for me. We've got 40 feet this way. We have the coral reef and Ellie very kindly has been swimming along the coral reef for you. Um, over the past few days and we've got some great footage from yesterday so we can see that and that's just out here amazing corals brain corals um, elk horn I don't know whether we've got any elk horn there whip corals um, and we've got all the other sponges there barrel sponges um, as well really really important ecosystem covering just one percent of the planet's surface but supporting 25% of all marine life. And that life is stupendous. Just a few yards from here, we've got octopus. There's a Murray eel down by my feet um, when we were broadcasting on Tuesday. Uh, spotted eagle rays gliding past, a pod of dolphins, and a variety of other fantastic wildlife. But for me, what's really, really cool is just the other way, 40 feet this way, is a research station. And that is where scientists can come and visit and study the reef. So they can do their field work on the reef and then the laboratory and analysis just behind us at the Kamabi Research Station. And I, they've been studying all kinds of things. We've been hearing from experts on sponges, coral restoration, coral reproduction, and the deep reef as well. But let's get down to the business in hand. So for this live investigation this morning, you will need a clear container full of water, uh, preferably seawater, just for added realism, but it doesn't matter if you don't have the sea just at your feet. I've just grabbed a few bits of coral for effect just from the beach this morning. And what we're looking at is we're looking at shape. The other thing we're going to need, or you're going to need, is some plasticine or some Play-Doh or modelling clay, something like that. And what I would love you to do is to make three equal size balls. And Ellie, I'll pick them up one by one and explain just in a little bit. Oh, that one needs to be a bit smaller. That's my last, last ball here. Now, we're talking about adaptation. 
And that's really how organisms, living things, have changed over time to do one of normally three things a bit better. The first thing that organisms like to get better at is to get food. The second thing that organisms tend to like to get better at is not being food, not being eaten. And the third thing that organisms tend to like to get better at is reproducing. We're going to look at the shark this morning. So the apex predator on the reef, the top predator on the reef. And think about what it has to be like in order to survive. How is it adapted to survive? What kind of shape is going to be best? Should it be a slow shape? Should it be a fast shape? Should it be somewhere in between? And so we've got three balls here. And I'm thinking here that we want to try and find a fast shape for the shark so that it moves through the water, it can catch its prey as fast as possible. So these sharks, they're not feeding on the coral, they're not feeding on the algae, they're not fe uh, feeding maybe on uh, crabs or other invertebrates on the, uh, the sea floor. They're f getting fish swimming away from them. So they need to be swim faster. Now, we're not going to make a model shark quite yet. What we're just going to think about is what shapes we can investigate. So what I want you to do, and maybe send some suggestions through to me on the live chat, is think about what shapes we could make out of our three balls of modeling clay for the shark. And then we'll test it by dropping it through the water and seeing which shape is fastest. Now, sharks are pretty amazing. They've been around for about 450 million years. Even if the ones around at the moment, most of them have only been around for 20, 120 million years. And they haven't had to evolve much because they've got their shape pretty well right. So, let's see what we've got coming in over the live chat. Have we got any suggestions coming in yet, Ellie? I reckon, I reckon a pancake, the pancake shark, the famous pancake shark. We're going to have the famous pancake shark first. How's that for a shape? Should sharks be f shaped like a pancake? That's going to be our first shape. Second shape. Uh, let's have a look. We're going to have the famous, other famous shark. These aren't real sharks, by the way. That's just a hint. The famous box shark. The mysterious box shark. Or cube shark of Curacao. That's going to be our second, our second shark. The box shark or cube shark of Curacao. Can I try a pyramid shape? Certainly. I might need some, um, how do, <laughs> can I make a pyramid very quickly with my hands? Uh, the answer is ish. Is Okay, very bad at making pyramids on the fly or standing in water, but that's kind of pyramid shape. Like that. Pyramid. And I'm going to choose one for me. I'm going to take one more ball of modeling clay and I'm going to make... I wonder what you've seen, other shapes that you've seen, you think about that could work and I'm going to make a sort of torpedo shape, like that. OK, I wonder what shapes, shapes you've got. And then we're going to start to test them. Uh, have you got those on the close-up, those shapes? Perfect. So we're going to test them in this order, and at, um, in the classroom, what I'd love you to do is to think about 
which one do you think is going to drop through the water fastest? And so we've got the famous pancake shark of Panama, the cube shark of Curaçao, the pyramid shark of Papua, it's an Indo-Pacific species, and the torpedo shark of Tobago. And we're going to see which one is going to go fastest through our amazing shark tank ocean. And we're going to see which one is most likely to catch the fish. Are you ready? I'm going to get my stopwatch up. And you're going to have to, please, um, I don't have pen and paper here to note down the times. So you're going to have to help me. Uh, we're going to start with the pancake shark of Panama. Now, when you put your shark shapes into your shark tank, don't drop them from a height. Hold them on the surface of the water and then let them go from there. And hold them at the surface in the direction you want them to be swimming. So I want the pancake shark of Panama. I'm going to hold it here. Is that okay, Ellie? Okay, and then one, two, three, drop. And stop. Ah. So that was uh, two seconds uh, and 28. 228. So you've got that noted down. 228. I've got sort of slightly wet and mucky fingers from, from all of this. I'm going to dry those off. Uh, we now have the famous cube shark of Curaçao. And I do think that's going to go faster or slower, and why do you think that's the case, than the pancake shark? So holding it here, ready? Oh, my wet hand didn't quite work, I'm going to have to do that again. So, that was 128, so a whole second faster. Um, to the gentleman who suggested the pyramid shark, what was his name? J. Ross. Um, okay, kite class. Which way up do I drop the pyramid in? Do I drop it with a pointy bit down or the flat bit down? So we're just going to see what, what we think might be the best way of dropping this, which way up. And I'll reset my stopwatch. We can do it both ways. I'm going to try it with the pointy bit down first. On your marks, I'll do it here. Get set, go. Oh. Now, I'm not very good at pressing these buttons, obviously. I'll try that one more time. Point down. Point down. Well, that was lucky, wasn't it? Uh, so that was 0.94 which is 0.32 of a second faster than the cube shark. And last but not least, we have the torpedo shark of Tobago. And predictions, please. I'm going to drop this on your marks. Get set. Go. Oh! That wasn't a very successful. That was 123. <laughs> And that didn't actually go through the water like I thought it would. I thought it was going to go straight up. I'm going to try that one more time. No. Nope. That is very, very interesting. It's got no steering. Should we give it some fins? So very quickly, going to make some fins for the Tobago shark. Might be faster, but it's not going very well through the water. A bit like that then. Fins? Okay. I've got really mucky hands, I'm going to have to clean them out. And then of course, 
phones won't work like this. Okay, reset. On your marks, get set, go. You laugh. You laugh, Ellie, behind the camera. Ellie laughing at me with my ridiculous streamlined shot making escapades. But that was, in fact, the fa it was the fastest. It's 0.88. Well, it, whatever it did, it was the fastest. So <laughs> I'm just thinking about um, how you got on in the classroom. And let's think about how this actually works. So if we think about something called water resistance, water resistance acts on the surface area. So if you've got a bigger surface, like this one, you've got more water pushing up. So this one's going to go through slower. If you've got less surface area, like the point of the pyramid, it's going to fall through faster. And we can see that with the shape of sharks. And I wonder how your predictions got on. I'm just going to get that down. Kite class are impressed with my pyramid. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, I actually, I don't know what shapes you came up with, but let's look at the, um, here's some I made earlier in true Blue Peter style. Have you got that one? So what we're looking at here is a shark that's rather better, better, well, better made. And um, we can see that it is going to have very little water resistance with the point and the streamlined shape, but enough space to have a large muscle area to actually propel itself fast through the water. Um, and I've managed to make this murky um, with a lot of um, purple Play-Doh. But so we have that shape. Different species of shark, we have the hammerhead. But again, with this wonderful streamlined shape, fins, oh, it's got a bit twisted there. Swim through the water. But it's a very, very different shape uh, to the spotted eagle ray, which will be searching for crustaceans to eat, gliding through the water. So what I'd love to do now is just to have a look at some of the other adaptations that you might find on the reef. I might just take out my shapes to help them dry out in the sun that's coming out here in Curacao. There we go. I wonder whether you got the predictions right for which one's going to fall through the water fastest. There we go. So I'd love to look at some of the other um, life on the reef. And Ellie, I think you've got some examples lined up for us to have a, to have a look at. What, what do we have up first? So we've, we've got the stonefish. Uh, so this, you can probably see some uh, sort of cloud of smaller fish in the background and then the main section of reef. I want you to try and see how many stonefish you can spot and also think about, if you can see any, how are they adapted to life on the reef? Yeah. Is it one stonefish, two stonefish, three? So hopefully you can see three stonefish Maybe a teacher can help to spot them. They almost look like they're sort of lying one on top of the other. And why might they be camouflaged that way? Why, why might they want to blend in with the background? And that's because they're ambush predators. So they're looking at hiding from potential prey unsuspecting prey will come past and be gobbled up. 
So going back to our different reasons for adaptation, and looking at survival techniques, these stonefish have adapted to blend in with the coral reef so that they can get more food. Who have we got next coming up? I think we've probably got another example coming up shortly. Ah, oh, we've got the sea cucumber, one of my favorite um, animals on the reef. Here you can see it breathing in and out. It's in fact the same cucumber, but we've put the, the photos together. And it's filling a niche on the coral reef, and it is making best use of all the dead and decaying matter in the sand. So it's basically designed a bit like a hoover, sucking in sand at one end and getting rid of it at the other, so like a, almost like a hollow tube, and having the ability to use that as food. Now, sorry, next one please, yes. So I'm just getting some questions coming in through on the live chat, which we're going to come to very shortly. They're great questions. Oh, we've got the manta ray, another favorite. Um, huge wingspan gliding through the water. But you'll notice the mouth is designed to filter through the water. So it's like a big sieve. So this is designed to get food called plankton, and that's the small plants and animals that are sort of floating in, in the ocean. So it's designed to sieve through the ocean, so it glides slowly through the ocean to collect that plankton. So a great, great shape for that. So there's lots of mosquitoes this morning if I'm waving in sort of front of them in the camera. And I think next we have a uh, tiger shark. So we, we've got the tiger shark here. And just thinking back to our investigation, looking at that shape and thinking about the other ways that um, tigers are, um, tiger sharks are adapted um, to hunting, amazing uh, cartilaginous um, bodies to, to, to move swiftly through the ocean. And cartilaginous means that they just have cartilage, but that's the sort of, that's the sort of like the bendy bits that your ears made of rather than bones themselves. They also have amazing um, uh, ability to detect sound up to 3,000 feet away. So if you are on the reef and you make a crunkling sound with a bit of plastic or something, um, sharks will, will come and check out what's going on, as well as um, great eyesight. And they have a sixth sense, um, and that is um, detecting electro impulses coming through the water. So a sixth sense for sharks there. I think we might just have a few more amazing reef um, creatures um, to share with you, and then we'll get on to your questions, which I can see coming through now. Parrotfish. Parrotfish, definitely one of the favourites. Amazing, beautiful colours of rainbow parrotfish, which you can see just in the waters out here. And their beak is shaped to scrape algae off the reef and sometimes to scrape even bits of coral as well. And that's where they get their name from. Now, one of the funny things to think about is that when they crunch on coral, um, which is essentially um, calcium carbonate limestone, then that gets all powdered up into a nice fine white powder, pooped out the back, and helps to form the beautiful white sands of tropical beaches. And I think we've got a second um, parrotfish uh, photo here, and that is showing one of the amazing ways to stay safe on the reef. Now, at night, sharks hunting at night, sensing out uh, different fish to have on the reef. And what the parrotfish does is it creates a mucus sleeping bag uh, so that sharks can't sense it on the reef. It's quite an amazing adaptation. And then we've got a final two. We're going to journey over not to the waters here, but to the waters over on the Great Barrier Reef, the sort of Indo-Pacific reefs and animals over, over, over that side. 
and we have I think the the clownfish Nemo very happily um, showing us a an interesting type of adaptation and that's a symbiotic relationship and there are a lot of symbiotic relationships on the reef where, where two different species are working together and here we can see the clownfish taking shelter in an anemone so anemone fish is another name for the clownfish and we can see that that provides protection the stinging tentacles of the of the of the anemone not stinging the clownfish it, it has a special mucous membrane over its skin that means it's sort of impervious uh, to the stinging cells and in return the clownfish um, gives nutrients uh, to the anemone through its poop and also wards off um, animals that might try and nip at the ends of the anemone's tentacles. They're very territorial uh, and if you're diving near an anemone with a clownfish they might come and attack your dive mask uh, and be quite aggressive uh, on the reef. I've got nods coming from behind the camera from Ellie who's ob obviously been attacked by numerous clownfish as well. And then lastly we have the crown of thorn starfish we can see very clearly on the starfish the defense mechanism of the, of, of the spiny thorns. We can see very clearly that it is very difficult to eat. Um, in fact, it has very few um, natural predators, only the triton's trumpet, a type of uh, marine snail. And it's a specialist corallivore. On the underneath, um, you can't see it in this photograph, but it sort of latches over uh, coral. It sort of ejects its sort of guts and enzymes onto the coral, dissolves that um, and then basically ingests that back into its body. So there we have a variety of different adaptations uh, on the reef. One of the things would be great to see and I'd love to see uh, if you could share these with us over the next couple of days, see if you can draw a picture of what you think is the ultimate reef animal Share it online if you can, hashtag Coral Live 2018. And we'd love to see what you think would make the ultimate reef animal and try and give us some reasons as well what makes that adapted so well to survive on the reef. A little challenge for you. There's also a um, shark off, so if you can make a better shark than this, I want to see it online too. And I hope you can. So now for the rest of this session, we are just going to come to the questions um, you've very kind, kindly been sending in. Um, Isaac says that sharks attack from below. They attack in, in, in lots of ways, but that's quite correct. Would the torpedo go faster from the bottom up? It's really, um, it's a water resistant, so whatever direction uh, the shark is moving through, the, the shape is just as important, whether it's up, down, left, right, but not backwards. Um, sharks do not have directional fins and so cannot swim backwards. Um, questions from the 5th Gymnasium of Glyfada. Um, and the first question is a really interesting one. Why haven't sharks evolved much compared to other organisms? I mean, if you get, if you get it right 20 million years ago, 120 million years ago, and you can survive, then there's no real reason to adapt. Um, one of the, you know, the, the sharks are one of those amazing examples of uh, an apex predator that is still going strong in the ocean. Uh, so that is one of the reasons why they haven't um, evolved much. So I'm just waiting. We've got this um, fantastic um, streaming here, but it does take sometimes a little bit of time to come through. What age can sharks live until? Um, wow, that's a really good question. Um, it depends really sort of what, what shark it is. Um, so some sharks just um, um, a few years. Um, some, I don't know what we've got, the, we're talking about last night, the oldest great white. Um, we can tell from, from one of the, <laughs> the really interesting ways of an aging a shark. Um, and that was um, looking at um, the vertebrates, so the vertebrates are a bit like um, trees, so you can almost count the rings in their vertebrates um, and you can tell how old um, the shark is. Very sadly, 
um, it would have to be um, okay so I mean how old is so if you get a great white you're looking at probably sort of 20 um, to 30 years old so th there there we go um, <laughs> So next up, um, what does the environment of a coral reef offer the sharks? It's a really, really great question. We've had a lot of the scientists over the past few days describe uh, the tropical waters as a marine desert. And so we can tell it's a marine desert because the waters are beautifully clear. And any of the shots that you've seen over the past few days, or the, at least shown this morning, you can see for sort of 30, 40, 50 meters, sometimes up to 100 meters through these wonderful tropical waters. And that means there's very little food here. If you're in the temperate waters, waters off um, the UK, for instance, quite murky, there's a lot of nutrition in there. And so incredibly uh, food poor, but in amongst this vast ocean desert, we have these oases, these coral reefs, which are creating amazing and supporting an amazing amount of life. Now, if you're a shark, you can go swimming through the wide open expanses and find absolutely no food. But if you come to a coral reef, it's a bit like um, coming to a huge array of different um, restaurants, cafes, food, a go-go. And so thank you very much, Eddie, for the, for the bug spray. Um, it is a particularly bitey morning this morning. And so that's why coral reefs are so important to, to sharks, is because they have that amazing concentration of food in one place. And sharks are also very important to coral reefs because they keep the sort of maybe diseased or old or lame animals down. They keep populations very, very healthy. Um, have you ever swum near sharks? Were you afraid? I think, I don't know, for me, the first time I s swam near a shark, you get that sudden sort of, ooh, it's a shark. It's a, a very distinctive shape. Uh, and that fear, I think, comes from the fact, first of all, that you're in its habitat. You're, it is designed to move incredibly swiftly through the water. Uh, we are not. And second, I think it's from the media and especially from films. I think we've had a film out recently, The Meg. Um, certainly, you know, a few decades ago there was Jaws. And this has characterized the shark as an incredibly dangerous and vicious, uh, aggressive animal. And that's really very far from the truth. Uh, sharks are inquisitive, yes, um, but we are not their natural food. Uh, and so you can be initially uh, afraid the first time maybe, but after a while, it is uh, a great privilege to be in the water with such an amazing animal. Uh, another question uh, we have is what could be the consequences for sharks if coral reefs change the acidification of the water? Well, certainly, if we have an um, issue with acidification, which can slow, halt, or reverse uh, the growth of coral reefs, depending on the pH levels, the acidity levels. That means that the coral reef um, declines. That in turn supports fewer fish. That in turn supports fewer sharks. So it has what's called a cascade through uh, the food chain. So as there's fewer areas of coral reefs, there's fewer small fish supported and all the way to fewer sharks supported. I think just thinking about um, threats to um, sharks, I think ocean acidification probably wouldn't be top at the moment. I think it's just important um, to uh, remember the amount of people killed by sharks and sharks killed by people. So I'll come back to that in just a minute. But just in your classrooms, see if you can guess the number of shark fatalities a year on average and then see if you can guess the number of sharks um, killed by humans each year. Um, we have, from a school in Estoril, Portugal, um, 
Diogo would like to know what do sharks feed on on the coral reef? It really depends um, what kind of shark it is. So there's a, a variety of different um, foods, mainly um, small fish, um, but tiger sharks will probably eat anything. Um, I think they've even found sort of welly boots, uh, rubber boots inside um, tiger sharks' um, stomachs. Um, but they'll, they'll eat sort of octopus, squid, fish, um, a variety of different um, animals on the reef. Um, but you'll have different, different sharks will be designed for, for, for different foods. Um, and some sharks, I mean, it's amazing to see the sort of very sort of bendy cartilaginous body able to get into some of the nooks and crannies of the reef as well and find some of the, the animals in there. Um, but, um, you know, everything from turtles to parrotfish um, to, uh, oof, um, to crabs. Um, there's a whole variety of different, different sharks eating different things on the reef. Uh, from the Heritage Private School, we've got a, a question coming in. Um, here we go. In an attempt to, re to restore coral reef, certain species are being cloned. How will this uh, loss of genetic diversity impact uh, the marine habitat? And that's from Letitia. Uh, Letitia, I have got some information for you. Um, is that there's cloning happening on the reef um, without us. So uh, I'm just trying to find a good example of a coral. I'm going to pick, pick this one up. So a new coral colony, like this one, starts off as a single polyp and that polyp will grow and that coral will split into two budding um, to form two coral polyps essentially cloning itself now it will keep on dividing and dividing dividing and dividing on a flat surface and they'll go actually we need there's more of us we need to sort of grow in a more three-dimensional shape and so we'll start to take calcium carbonate from the water and grow this shape up and still living just over the surface here. So cloning is already taking place, but you're right, there are some coral species and we'll, we'll find out um, in about an hour's time when we're speaking to uh, restoration technician Kelly about the different species that are proving more resilient to environmental change. Um, so that's definitely something to think, of, think about but it's, it's, um, we'll talk about the diversity of different uh, coral larvae that are in the lab at the moment and how restoration can make that work. But, just, but cloning um, in the restoration projects really here is, is collecting the um, fertilized eggs, the larvae, and helping them survive those first initial stages of development uh, and then bringing them back out on, onto the reef. Um, so cloning isn't, isn't a part yet of um, coral restoration. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, from Edith Morehouse, how many types of shark are there? Um, I, think the, uh, I think we're looking at about, I mean, 70 different species of shark. Um, I mean, we're just, we're trying to name, name as many different sharks as you could, I and mean, we're actually just going down to the smallest shark. Um, which is the uh, dwarf lantern shark, and that's about six inches long. Um, then we've got uh, the whale shark, um, dwarf lantern living deep in the oceans, um, using bioluminescence to attract prey. All the way up to the biggest shark, uh, which is the whale shark, uh, over uh, 40 feet long. Um, and that amazing shark, like the basking shark, um, is a filter feeder um, going through the water, um, filtering out um, different foods. We've got the laziest shark in the world, uh, which is the nurse shark. I think it's one of the only species um, that uh, doesn't, <laughs> that sleeps in fact, and just stops bringing water over, over its gills. Um, and we've got, what else have we got? We've got the hammerhead shark, which is amazing eyes on, on the sort of side of its head to get a, a better all-round view of, of the reef. Um, we have um, the reef sharks, which are probably um, more, more common in this area. We have the um, blue shark, uh, which is the most endangered shark on the planet, very, very sadly. And then the very famous, we have the 
um, great white shark with rows and rows of teeth um, and get through as many as 30,000 teeth over its lifetime. And the Meg, the Meg um, has been uh, not around for about 16 million years. So great diversity of shark life around. What's next up? Um, what age can sharks live until? So we've got um, great whites, um, it's about 20, 30 years old. Um, smaller species are not living um, quite so long. Great questions coming through there. Um, what, oh, here we go. Um, what um, species of shark is the biggest shark um, you have seen? I have um, not seen huge amounts of different sharks. One of the things I'd love to see is a whale shark, uh, the biggest fish um, in the world, um, at, uh, growing up to over 40 feet long. Um, Ellie, have you, have you been with a whale shark? Swam with a whale shark? Excellent. I, just, just, just over that way. Um, so if we're, if we're very lucky this weekend, we might go and swim with whale sharks. Uh, but the big shark I've swum with has only been sort of reef sharks, and they are only um, a few feet long, sort of five, six feet long. Um, do we have... I've got no internet connection um, coming through on here. So if there's... Uh, it really depends on the species of shark. So the question is, do shark eat turtles? They can do. What is their favorite food? Um, it really depends on the species. So a basking shark, a shark you might find off the coast of the UK quite often, its favorite food is plankton. Um, a uh, great white, like seals, um, that's quite often why you might find a shark attack on surfers, because uh, from coming up from underneath, they look like a slightly unhappy seal all splashing around um, from, from down, uh, the view from down in the ocean. Um, other, other sharks have different foods. That's from Sophie. Thank, Sophie, thank you so much. Reese would like to know what my fa favourite shark is. Uh, my favourite shark? Uh, I quite like the goblin shark. Um, it's a type of deep sea shark. Uh, and I think it, I'm right in saying it is the oldest species of shark that's still alive. So they're, they're 160 million um, years old. So have a look at the goblin shark online. Um, but I've got a, a, I mean, the whale shark is the shark I most want to swim with. Um, and I haven't yet. So the whale shark, I think, is, I mean, it's just an astonishingly beautiful creature. Is there a response to the question about the Yeah. Okay, so we think, so they're coming back, we think that sharks kill more people. No, people kill more sharks and sharks kill people. Okay, so we're looking at roughly a year, uh, probably between 4 and 15 um, fatal shark attacks on humans. Um, so... Uh, and then, so that's, I don't know whether that's kind of what you thought. Uh, I think there is about half a million deaths from the mosquito. So if you think about the mosquito and the shark and their relative um, dangers. And then what is uh, incredible to me is the number of sharks killed by humans. And, and it's um, driven by the shark fin trade. And very often the fins are cut off a living shark and the shark carcass or you know still thrown back into the ocean unable to swim um, and dies and that is happening to about a hundred million sharks every year so roughly for every fatal shark attack between 10 and 20 million sharks are being killed um, what is the biggest type of shark that you have on the reef in Curacao? that would be the whale shark spotted here the biggest shark in the world Alfie would like to know how fast sharks can swim. Alfie, that is a great question, and I don't have the answer on... 40? Wow. Um, so, Ellie has just let me know that we've got the Great White at 40 miles an hour, um, and the Mako shark, um, looking, we're looking at pretty, pretty amazing speeds, um, beautiful streamlined shape, torpedo-like shape through the water, at 60 miles an hour. Uh, 
so if you would like to know how many different varieties of fish does a shark eat and do they have a favorite <laughs> I, th I think you know most most fish will end up as, as some kind of shark uh, food um, over time and it really depends on the species of shark I mean for looking at the great white it actually prefers seals um, to so I'm just being sort of generally attacked by um, bugs this morning um, Reese would like to know um, what my uh, favorite shark is. I think we may have gone, and I'm going to keep on coming back to the, to the um, whale shark. I don't know whether that's because it's a plankton feeder and obviously um, is not going to mistake me for something to investigate and nibble on or, or whether the fact that they're amazingly huge creatures um, and I think it would just be very special to swim with one. I don't know where we are on, on streams and, and, and links and that kind of thing. Olivia would like to know whether chemicals in the ocean poison sharks. I mean, Olivia, that's certainly a, a possibility. I'm not quite sure. What I do know is that in um, s some species like swordfish, you get higher concentrations of mercury. And I'd be surprised if you didn't get what's called bioaccumulation. Um, of um, chemicals in the ocean going, f going from smaller species all the way up to the apex predator, the shark. Um, but certainly, um, you know, there are government health warnings in the UK, for instance, pregnant women not eating um, swordfish um, because of high levels of mercury um, contained, contained in them. Um, so that's very much a problem with apex predators, concentrating um, the chemicals um, in the ocean up through the food chain. Yeah. Okay, so this is Max in year four would like to know is coral an animal? And is it Neve? Would like to know what coral is made of? That is a great, great question. I'll just get my little um, coral here. Um, so various things crawling up the um, jetty towards me. Um, <laughs> do we do we have um, some corally pictures or video that we can show um, as well? So um, Neve and Max was it? So Neve and Max, uh, are you all familiar with a jellyfish? Jellyfish like this? Hopefully, yes. Okay, all familiar with the uh, sea anemone, which is essentially a jellyfish, tentacles, mouth in the middle stuck to the bottom of the sea and Nemo lives in the middle. Now what I want you to do is that we've got a picture of a um, just um, some coral here um, underwater and what I want you to imagine is that over the surface of that shape um, is that you've got lots and lots of tiny little anemone like creatures that we call coral polyps and that's an animal. And so over the surface there, you won't be able to see the tentacles so much during the day because they're normally retracted during the day and they come out and feed at night. But going on to the question, is coral an animal? Um, Ellie, if we come back to having a look at this rock here, what we're doing before. So on the surface, we've got all the tiny anemones. Um, so coral polyps, same type of creature. And what they're doing is that they're taking calcium carbonate, this mineral, this rock-like mineral, from the ocean and forming these amazing structures, like a skeleton, and living on the outside. Now, what you can probably see from, although it's a little bit dirty, but the whitish colour of these coral skeletons, but when you saw the corals in the ocean, they probably looked a bit more like a plant-like colour. And the reason for that is that the polyps that live in here have inside them an algae that helps provide them with sugars. The algae, a plant-like living thing inside their tissue, giving them sugars. And they get their plant-like colour because they're clear, see-through like a jellyfish, the see-through like a jellyfish, but have this algae inside them, and that gives them their reddish, brownish, greenish, yellowish colours on the reef. They also sometimes have bonkers colours, 
but that's from the sort of sunblock chemicals they can also have inside their tissue. So Max and Eve, to answer, to answer your question, the coral polyp is an animal that has a vegetable living inside it, providing it with up to 70, 90% of their energy and forms a rock-like skeleton so it can grow and create the amazing reef. How's that? We've got a next, next question coming up. See if we've got any... So the, the damp and the connection has... Okay. I've got one from... Uh, Nova Yagorovka School in Ukraine. Can we grow corals at home? Certainly, there's a... Um, a lot of people have coral aquaria. Uh, and I think it's just making sure that if you get any tropical fish or if you get any tropical invertebrates, there's a coral themselves, that's done responsibly. I, I don't know how the responsible aqua tropical aquarium uh, trade works, but I'm sure there's information online. So if you are interested, it's something you can do. It's pretty tricky, um, but definitely you can do it. And, um, but be careful about sourcing it. Uh, one of the uh, really... Um, sad impacts of finding Nemo is that a lot of people went to collect Nemo's from the reef um, and, it, and it had a, a negative impact, impact on the clanfish population. So who is that? Amos. Amos would like to know how the coral reef got there. So if it's a reef, a reef is basically a navigational um, hazard. So a reef can be made of, of lots of different things. Um, it could be just rock, it could be dead sponges, glass sponges, uh, and it's essentially a hazard. So it's a, it's, a, it's a shipping or a naval term to put on maps. Now, a coral, how did the coral reef get there? So growing on top of this um, rocky seafloor, coral polyps grew skeletons out of minerals in the water. They died. Another coral polyp came and grew another skeleton on here. Another one came on like this. And gluing it all together in an amazing three-dimensional shape you have what's called crossnose algae. So an algae that acts, a red algae that acts a bit like cement to stick all these uh, shapes together. And so that's how the coral reef is formed over many, many years. I can't really use my phone to look at the live chat with wet hands. Okay. Yes, Heritage Private School. Good. In an attempt to restore Yes. I think we've, we've, we've covered that one before. We talked about cloning, didn't we? About potential loss of diversity, biodiversity um, through cloning and, and talking about how the cloning qu hasn't quite, we haven't quite got to that stage at the moment. In coral restoration, although corals do clone themselves to grow in a process known as budding, the polyps clone themselves. In terms of coral restoration, it's really identifying at the moment, A, supporting the early stages of, of the coral life cycle, um, because you sort of, if you have 10 million eggs and you get 100,000 fertilized eggs and you get sort of 1,000 sort of larvae and sort of making sure that those numbers come up, those percentages come up. But also looking at different factors. Um, do they like to settle on... Um, different materials, do they like different colours? Um, do they survive better at different flow rates um, coming over them? So what with their tentacles is the best uh, speed of water coming over them to catch little copepods and other plankton? Uh, so that's where a lot of the research is happening just behind us here, is looking at how coral restoration can be more successful by understanding those early life stages better and actually supporting uh, coral reproduction in the lab and then bring it back out onto the reef. 
rather so we haven't quite got to cloning yet um, so there's no sort of a mutant corals um, Catherine. Catherine yep Oh, how can um, tourism um, on coral reef be made sustainable? I mean, it's a really good question about sort of nature tourism in, in general. And nature tourism, what it allows is for tourism and people who live near the reef to have a, a revenue from the natural environment without having to sort of chop it down or, or think about alternative uses, you know. What could a coral reef be used for? Well, you could use it for fishing, you could use the reef itself for building materials, but tourism offers the opportunity to use it um, or to get revenue from it without using it up just by people coming to visit. Now, what's really important, as you point out, is that it's done in a sustainable way. So, first of all, you're looking at how people behave near the reef, and so that, of course, is not uh, knocking the reef or physically damaging the reef, either through fin damage from swimming or from anchoring um, and using the, the reef as an anchor. So having fixed anchor points near the reef that boats can use. Second, how can we reduce um, pollution coming from coastal developments, from hotels and that kind of thing, getting onto the reef and in fact, it might be interesting to think about how sponges could play a role in sewage and water treatment. Um, and that's one of the things that we've been talking about earlier this week. And, and then it is potentially about, you know, can you get everybody out there? Can you take huge numbers to every part of the reef? Or do you have to zone off different parts of the reef um, and say, well, some people can only go there um, for scientific purposes, some people can go there for tourism, some people can go there, well nobody can go there except for the uh, park rangers. And so there's different ways that tourism can be made more sustainable, but it's a great question. And in fact, I think I'm right in saying it is about sort of 40% of the value of the reef um, is um, from tourism um, to the economy. And that's supporting livelihoods for about, sort of the reef supports livelihoods for about 350 500 million people around the world. Ben, can we stop coral bleaching? Ben, can we stop coral bleaching? <laughs> Two answers to that, one of which is no, um, because there's natural variability in temperature, uh, there will always will be, and uh, so there will always be, um, from time to time, um, coral getting bleached. And coral bleaching is where a rise in ocean temperature breaks down that relationship between the coral polyp and the algae inside. And so when that breaks down, the algae goes away, so the coral loses its color and becomes white. Because the algae provides so much of the energy for the coral polyp, um, then what you're gonna see is um, that coral polyp slowly starving. Now, the breakdown um, does occur because ocean temperature will always vary for, for a number of different reasons. The problem we're facing at the moment is that due to climate change that is happening more often. And so coral reefs don't have time to recover. And so my first answer was, can we stop coral bleaching? One answer is no. Can we stop it being, having such a huge impact on the reef that we saw in the mass bleaching events in 2016 and 2017 on the Great Barrier Reef? And the answer is yes, it's completely up to us about the future that we make and whether we try and, and reduce the carbon emissions to such an extent that we reduce warming below 1.5, below 1 degree. And in that way, we can stop the predicted mass bleaching events reducing coral reefs to a very minimal extent. Um, are, we, are we a quarter of an hour over time already? Wow. Thank you so, so much uh, for all your amazing questions. Um, really hope that you stay with us to learn more about coral restoration and coral adaptation um, from Kelly, a restoration technician, in just half an hour now. Um, but thank you and get those uh, photographs and um, ideas about the ultimate coral animal up online, hashtag Coral Live 2018. But for now, from Coral Live at the Kamabi Research Station, it's goodbye. Bye-bye.